on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. The Sooners got another commitment in the transfer portal, and we talked some early OU betting lines that came out in the National College Football Roundup. Nick Saban, Jimbo Fisher, oh, drama. The NCAA changed the initial counters rule, and we talk about the elimination of divisions in college football that is coming. We finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, May 23rd, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including blackjack, blackjack match, roulette, and Teddy's favorite, craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts and the beats and bites festival starts this month it's this week people night ranger and starship will be performing may 28th it's five dollar general admission and kids under 12 get in free there'll be a ton of food trucks and there will be all kinds of things for the kids kiddos to do including face painting and an inflatable obstacle course to buy tickets visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now we're recording this Sunday night. Please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. Also, if you would like to sponsor the podcast during football season, email the Oklahoma breakdown at gmail.com. Ted, how are we doing? Fantastic. What a weekend. Uh, a lot of good stuff going on out there, man. I can't complain. Full disclosure. And I know we'll talk about it in winners and losers, but went to the PGA championship at Southern Hills on saturday and sunday exhausting just exhausting took took the little man on sunday he was crawling all over the place uh, he was he crawled across the 17th fairway like 15 times we That's got some awesome. great pictures and videos from it though when he's on the pga tour i'll be able to say this is where it all started son that's awesome. Really cool. Now, did you start to get worried about getting home in time whenever you saw we're going to a playoff? I, I was concerned, but I was like, I, I have faith. I have faith. And if we made it, don't worry. We made it, man. We're, we're oh, recording good. at the normal time. Didn't have to send you that. Hey, man, I'm going to need a little extra time. Text. I was prepared for it because I, I thought that I was like, okay, it's not that far of a drive, but there could be some traffic with everyone pouring out of their headed back to Oklahoma City. Yeah. Full so. disclosure. We left before the playoff. Ah, smart. Very I, smart. I know. Judge well, me if was, you must, people. You would have had to. I mean, I, I don't know if you were out there. I don't know. We'll get to it later. We'll get to it. All right. Let's talk some more. You football and Sooners got another transfer portal commit from former Arizona State wide receiver LV Bunkley Shelton. What a name that, that I mean, this guy's got a name. L.V. Bunkley Shelton, a 5'11", 195-pound wide receiver. He's got three years of eligibility left. And, Ted, from what I've seen of him, my initial reaction is that he's a guy that can add some depth. I don't want to say he's just a body. I think he's more than that. I, I think he is a guy that can add some depth, especially in the slot. Now, I, I personally think he ended up at Arizona State when he did probably because he doesn't have great vertical speed, just not terribly fast in a straight line. But the one thing that certainly stands out to him, for me at least, when I watch his tape is he, he's got some wiggle to him at the top of his routes, you know, option routes there in the middle of the field. He, he can lose some guys and, and create some separation. He he's very sudden 
at the top of those types of routes. Also, you know, kind of those head hesitation slants, hesitation out routes. It's it, it's pretty impressive watching that stuff. But yeah, I not entirely sure how fast the guy is, but seems like a guy that could add add depth to the wide receiver room. And when when you look at the numbers in that room, still not terribly deep even though we're really excited about the talent in there so nice addition right I, I think he's more than just a guy just a body but I, I'm not expecting this guy to be a you know 500 yard wide receiver for them or anything like that though yeah I agree um he, he's he looks like a like a sharp all all around receiver that he can kind of do everything not going to blow you away with speed as you mentioned but a guy that's that's got enough athleticism to be able to run routes really sharply. And, you know, if you've got a good understanding of defenses and kind of how to find yourself open can be a nice asset. I that you're right. It's not numbers wise super deep, but it's gonna be hard to get yourself on the field with the with the crew that's in there. It, it's not huge numbers wise, but I would say like top to bottom right now there are a bunch of guys that can help them win and uh, I really like the group that they've got I think it's going to be really competitive um, because I do think there's going to be some battles there for some some guys to find their way on the field um, it's I think it's going to raise the level for everyone and I don't know I, I think there's just a bunch of really good options right now at wide receiver keep we keep talking about it or at least I keep bringing it up is Everyone's just a little bit different, and I like that. I like having guys that bring a little bit something different to the table, and that may even help you if you want to go with a little bit deeper of a rotation than, than maybe you typically would. Yeah, and, and when you think about what Levy really likes to major in offensively, he's, he's an 11 personnel guy, right? And, and you look at – with, with that being the case, you're going to have three wide receivers on the field. And, and I think, and I know that's a long way uh, until week one against UTEP, but, but I think it's pretty clear that Marvin Mims, Jaleel Farouk, Theo Weiss, are, and Drake Stoops are the four guys that they feel really, really good about. And it's up to these other guys, right? Brought in Hester the transfer from Missouri, which I guess goes by JJ. I was told that JJ Hester and that guy, we, we know he's got speed, but you've got also, you've got guys that have been there for a while. So we'll see, but you're right. I, I feel like we know those four are going to be key contributors. And then, I mean, how many wide receivers are you going to play? Six, seven, eight. I, I don't know. I would say at least six because you know that's the one thing about up tempo is those receivers when you get rolling i mean there's a lot of running they're sprinting down the field and they're sprinting back to get lined up and set up and ready to snap the ball next and you know a lot of times the super snap super fast snaps come after running plays but my guess is if you've got the same personnel out there and you run five or six snaps of up tempo, move the ball down the field, and then maybe have an incomplete pass, there's going to be some wideouts tapping the head to come out. And you probably have to be prepared to have a full, full change of 11 personnel, uh, at least to be able to, um, you know, to run your stuff as normal and as quickly as you want. Yeah. So you start thinking about a guy like Jaden Gibson, right? No doubt he's got all the talent in the world. Now, he's more of an outside guy, clearly, being being 6'5", but, man, uh, that guy's going to have to earn reps. Yeah. The same thing with the Anderson kid. I know they loved him, the other freshman wide receiver, before he got injured in spring. He was doing some really, really good things. So, yeah, it's that's how you want it, though, man. You want it tough. Yeah, and you, a guy like Trayvon West, right? Brian Darby, like those guys, it's going to be, now that you've got Hester, you've got Bunkley Shelton in the room, it's going to be it's gonna be an absolute battle to get reps at wide receiver, which, and this kind of goes back to what we always bring up, 
when these rooms start to get a little crowded, it's just going to raise the level of play of everyone. Right? That's, yep. that's the hope at least. Totally agree. I think it's, uh, it's shaping up to be a really competitive group and that typically means big time production. Yeah. And it sounds like Jeremiah Cradell uh, gets an assist for LV Bunkley Shelton committing to Oklahoma. Sounds like they've been, they've been tight for a long, long time. They go way back. So that that's always nice when you've got a, when you've got a guy that's on staff is, you know, a student analyst, student assistant, whatever you want to call it uh, on the defensive side of things. And he can, he can talk to someone he has a prior relationship with. Is it that nice? That's a, that's a very nice thing to have. Hey, and it's nice if you're trying to get into coaching and you know, that's one of the parts of it. Right, what are your ties? Who can you bring in recruiting? It's a nice little win there. Yeah. Good. Good for you, Jeremiah. Well, well done. Way to, way to contribute any way you can. That's, that's how you move up in the coaching world, baby. I like it. Okay. So it's that time of the year, Ted. We got some betting lines that are, that are coming out that have come out from FanDuel, and they put out quite a few big 12 betting lines, which means of course, there are some early OU betting lines. OU opens as a four and a half point favorite at Nebraska. Your initial reaction. Uh, I think the line is probably right. I think OU will cover that and has the chance to perhaps cover it big, but I think that line is probably right considering that Nebraska's played in, I don't know how many one score games in a row. Um, and last year against OU, it was, it was the same, but I, I think, I think that is, I think that's going to be enticing for OU backers whenever they see that it's less than a touchdown against Nebraska. Um, you know, we, we have the capabilities to go in there and, and route Nebraska. We do. I don't think they have the capability to route us. Um, they have the capability to play us tight. They, they've had some solid play on defense. They kept the defensive staff there. Um, they've got a new offensive staff. Venables is familiar with this offense, played against them last year in the ACC. So I think it stacks up, as you look at it right now, stacks up really well for Oklahoma. But we've got some unknown. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's to be expected, though, to keep it within that one score range whenever you're going against Nebraska. Yeah, and – that's going to be, I was trying to think of like the most hostile road environment OU's played in, in a while and Nebraska. And I know everyone knows how, how nice their fans are. So, but like that place gets loud. That's, that's not going to be an easy environment for this football team to go into. But when you, like you mentioned, I think Nebraska's defense, I know everyone's a lot of people in Lincoln are excited about Casey Thompson and what he could be, you know, possibly being an upgrade with what they've had recently with Adrian Martinez. But the question for Nebraska after talks to some people uh, close to that program, it, it's the defense, right? Well, will that defense be able to stop anybody lost a lot of good players off that defense? And will that defense not only be able to stop anybody, but who on that defense will be able to get to the quarterback seems to be the big question after spring ball for the Huskers. So I, I see that and I'm like, Oh yeah, <laughs> lay the four and a half, no doubt. But then I have to remind myself that is going to be, it's going to be a tough environment for, for a team that, you know, you, there's a lot of newness for OU. So that'll be, that'll be like the first test of some of these new faces, you know, on the roster, but also these coaches, you know, coaching together in an environment like that, they haven't, that will be the first time they've experienced anything like that together as a staff. Think about this. You've got, this is going to be the 22 season. 
last year we didn't have what was our biggest road game last year um trying to think of wherever where we even went last year. baylor baylor which, you know, is a cool stadium, but it holds, what, 45,000 people? Oklahoma State with what was on the line for that game is probably yeah. the, the right answer. So, Oklahoma State, small stadium. Um, then you go back to the 2020 season, right? You, you were playing in the, the restricted uh, capacities. Like, you got to go all the way back to 2019. And even 2019, it's probably the same at Baylor. You know, it was probably the biggest road game there, not con- not counting the the semifinal. We don't play very many big time road games. I mean, Ohio State was in seventeen whenever it was on the road, but that's one of the problems with the Big Twelve Conference, and always been one of my big complaints is, I you've got these tiny stadiums that you go to, and most of the places they're never full, and this is good. This will probably be the bit the biggest road crowd they've played in front of and since, since 2017. Yeah. The place hold what it holds 90,000 Memorial stadium there in Lincoln. Well then, yeah, definitely since, since 2017. So yeah, I, now I'd still lay the four and a half, but no doubt it it is. It's interesting to think of it that way. Like that is, they are going to be going into an environment that maybe now, I know there's some transfers that have played, you know, in some big venues, you know, a couple guys coming from the SEC, stuff like that. But it's, like, it's going to be the most hostile environment a lot of these kids have ever played in. Yeah, I don't think – there's not any kids, maybe some super seniors that were on the trip for that 2017 game, right, at Ohio State. But this is going to be the biggest that any of those guys have been to. And – and let's not forget, Nebraska was the best three and nine team of all time last year. They were, or at least that's what I was told. One game, one score uh, in every every single game, right? Every loss. They like to keep it close when they lose. Uh, that place, that place is going to be rocking for it that will game. Be. It will be. It's kind of yeah. like Custer's last stand for uh, Scott Frost, isn't it? It definitely is. That's a that's a massive game for his future. Yep. Right. And you mentioned like Mark Whipple coming from Pitt. He, he doesn't want to have to get a new job. <laughs> like, no. So that's it. That's going to be a motivated staff and a fired up Nebraska fan base. Okay. The next early line that's out. OU is a one point dog versus Texas in the cotton bowl. Yeah. Your thoughts. I don't know. I don't know how you justify that. Now, I would probably, if I was setting the line, I would probably set it at OU minus two and a half. But, I mean, that's not that big of a difference between the two. But I don't know. I just, I have no clue how you could justify putting Texas as the favorite in that game as we sit right now. I I, I think the justification would be that Quinn Ewers is the second coming. And I've so you and I we we've talked about how much skill talent they have offensively. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt. I think Xavier Worthy is he's going to be a star. I think Jordan Whittington, when he's healthy, is fantastic. Bijan Robinson is the best running back in all of college football. All right, they got two big athletic guys. Even though I'm out at I'm out on Billingsley, I may be more in on Sanders at the tight end spot. But that that offense is going to score points. A lot of people don't realize. Texas last year, when you just look at the conference game, they, they led the big 12 in scoring. Mm-hmm. They can score. So that's where I, I think that offense is going to be, is going to be humming. I just don't know about the defense. And, and I know that Sark, he's had a lot of success in the transfer portal. I just, it, it, that game is always decided in the trenches. And I got some serious questions about Texas at the offensive tackle position and what that defensive line is going to look like. So I, I kind of love that OU is an underdog right now. Now we'll see, you know, we'll see when the second Saturday in October rolls around. What I'd be what's shocked. What. My, it'll end up being OU minus two and a half would be my guess. 
I think that will that will largely depend on what happens in week two with Texas against Bama. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what's going to happen week two, Texas against Bama, is that tackle problem that they have is going to be really apparent for a quarterback taking his first snaps, you know, what second start of his career, and he's going to have one of the best defensive players college football has seen in a decade coming after him from off the edge, and he's got a tackle problem. He could be a bit skittish after that game. What happens, and this is this is a very real possibility. They could be starting a true freshman at tackle in that game, right? There's been there's been a lot of talk about how some of the tackles played throughout spring ball, and Sark's even talked about it. Hey, we got like they got like five or six really highly recruited guys along the offensive line coming in in the summer, ready to compete. Can you imagine if they're starting a true freshman against Will Anderson in week two? Oh my God. It's going to be ugly. Uh, and I, Hey, I'm, I'm, there's no doubt in my mind that Quinn Ewers has a ton of talent, throws a really good ball and he's probably going to work himself into be a really good quarterback, but first year starter. I, I just, we'll see. We'll see. I, he, he will have had that. And I know that that game's in awesome, but he will have had that game against Bama to kind of feel that big, that big game feeling right. Guy hasn't felt that in a long time. Well, so. that's true, but big game feeling. I'm not here defending fresh, viewers. No, no, I'm no, just no. saying, I'm just like, but what my thing is like, if it's a big game feeling a big game atmosphere and you're getting absolutely pummeled uh, off the edges because you can't block anyone. But it doesn't have you feeling real good in the next big game atmosphere. Yeah, especially if Texas can't run it against Bama, that's where think things could get could get real dicey for them quickly in that game. I I will say, when it comes to OU Texas, if if FanDuel or whatever sports book, if they could just put the shrug emoji where the line goes, like you, yeah. you really, I mean, just look at last year's game. I mean, that game was insane. Yeah. So it's crazy. You, you never really know, but from a, from a, ex, from an experience standpoint, like Dylan Gabriel is way more experienced than Quinn Ewers. He's played in bigger games in college. So you would expect him to be a little more comfortable. Now he hasn't played no U Texas, but you would expect if you're just thinking big, big games, usually you're thinking head coach and quarterback right now. I think Sark and BV, uh, both generally unproven as head coaches. Now, maybe Sark showed us more that, you know, with what happened at Washington, happened at USC. Maybe he's proven more that he's not a great head coach at this point in his career. But, yeah, when you think about those big games, head coach, quarterback, going into it, I, I know it's a long way away, but I feel pretty good about OU's chances. Yeah. Yeah, I I did too. It's good. I I'm trying to think of when the last time, because usually it's not it's not a hundred percent. But first time starters at quarterback do not fare well at OU Texas, and I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think when the last time we had two first time starters in that game on both sides of the ball, um, for both teams. So. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, been a while. That's for sure. Okay, last early betting line that came out. Oklahoma State in Norman. Sooners open as a five and a half point favorite against the Cowboys. That is in this year. Remember, Bedlam is not on. It, it's not on that Thanksgiving weekend this year, right? It's the week before. Is that right? I think so. You know how they make that weird every once in a while? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's the way it is this year. I suppose I could just pull up the schedule and that, that would be helpful. But uh, it's I'm, a long time from now. It's a long time. For, great point. It is a long time from now. But with I, I'm just taking I'm uh, I'm taking OU by a touchdown every time in Norman. And even yep. though we we've had some 
we've had some really, really good bedlams over the last decade, but with, with everything Oklahoma state lost. And, and I know that Spencer Sanders was the first team all big 12 quarterback and he's back and they got some pieces on offense back, got some offensive line pieces back, but just, they just lost so much defensively uh, in, in the secondary and at linebacker. I know they got some of those defensive linemen back, but, and I think Colin Oliver is, is on his way to being one of the best players in the big 12 on the defensive side of the ball. But, I just, I look at that and I'm like, oh yeah, give, give me, uh, I'll lay that five and a half Bedlam in Norman. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, I think it's really interesting what style of football Oklahoma state's going to play this coming season. You know, you've, you're going to have the quarterback that's got a ton of experience. You're going to have some good weapons offensively, defensively. I, I know they've got good pieces, but it will be somewhat of a rebuilding year after last year. Last year was an elite defense. They're not going to play defense at that level again this this season. I, I don't think there's any chance. Got a new defensive coordinator, lost some guys that had played a ton of really good football for them. So I wonder if they're going to kind of switch back to an offensively driven football team. Um, I don't know. I I think that they're just going to have a lot of lot of trouble with OU. And by the time these two teams play is when I feel like Oklahoma is going to be hitting their full stride. And that that's a that's a really interesting point because I, I've thought a lot about that. I don't think they can play the way that they played last year. I don't uh, you you can't be that conservative offensively in 2022. Because it, you're, you're right, that defense isn't going to be as good. I mean, it, I, that's the best defense they've had in the history of the school. Yeah. right. It, 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 they were elite last year. Elite. It, it, is, it is unrealistic to think. Now, Der, I, I think Derek Mason's a heck of a football coach. I think they're going to have a lot of carryover from what Jim Knowles did in that system. I think they're probably going to blend what Derek Mason likes and what they had a lot of success with, with Knowles and, and kind of, form some hybrid system that's got got the best of both but Spencer Sanders is going to have to win him some games right throwing the football down the field and when you say it out loud yeah like, oh <laughs> oh okay so when they take the reins off man you know what happens he turns the football over and and maybe they run it really well like they did last year right remember the formula run yeah. now I know Jalen Warren isn't coming back right I know he's gone but it was running with Jalen Warren and then play really, really good defense. I, I think the defense could be good. They're not going to be really, really good. And we'll, we'll see if, you know, a guy like Dominic Richardson or what someone can take over as the feature back there for the Cowboys. But I just think, I mean, they're going to have to rely on Spencer Sanders a little more. And with what we've seen from him in his career, that's just, that's probably not something you want if you're an Oklahoma State fan. Problematic. Problematic. Problematic indeed. All low right, let's get to call your shot. Oh, sorry. I was just going to no. say low, low 60% um, completion percentage, and he's like a two-to-one touchdown to interception ratio guy, which in college football these days is not good. It's Some of them are more like eight-to-one or ten-to-one. It's crazy. I, I assume the Oklahoma State fans that hate listen to this podcast probably are like, listen, he he's going to carry all that momentum over from the Fiesta Bowl. That's that's the real Spencer Sanders. Uh, I just doesn't matter. You can look at down seasons with him, and you can look at last season with him. It's the exact same, exact statistically identical years is what he's put together. I feel like he has he has showed us what he is and I just don't think it's realistic to to expect some giant leap from him so right. well we'll see but yeah interesting OU opens as a five and a half point favorite in Bedlam all right for call your shot we we asked you which of these lines was the most interesting to you and why this first one comes from at sooner for Venables. He says, Texas 
as a one point favorite, considering that they went five and seven last year and have an unproven QB. I wouldn't consider them the favorite rivalry games like the red river shootout are hard to call though, because it's always a wild game. Yeah. That, uh, that last last sentence from sooner for Venables that that says it all for me. Yeah, I agree. I, I can tell you this. It's going to be close. I, I'm not necessarily saying uh, I can't guarantee you who's going to win the game. I can guarantee you pretty much that it's going to be close, but Oklahoma should be the favorite in this football game. Doesn't mean they're going to win it. Doesn't have anything to do with how good Texas may or may not be this upcoming season. But when you look at the track record of the two programs in recent years, you don't, you shouldn't just say, well, Hey, maybe it's going to be this year that Texas gets it flipped around. Shouldn't do that. I would because I I took a took a hard look at all of the Big Twelve lines because I was talking about them on my Sirius XM show, and so Texas is a fifteen point dog against Bama, right in that Week Two matchup. But the Longhorns are a one point favorite against OU. They are a one point favorite on the road against Oklahoma State. They're a five and a half point favorite at home against Baylor which to me seems to suggest that Texas will be favored in every big 12 game, right? If they're favored over OU, Oklahoma state and Baylor, that, uh, that seems to suggest that looking at, and those lines for, from, were from FanDuel. Maybe they're different other places, but yeah, I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Yeah. I may actually, since, um, I, I don't know how to do it, but I'll I'll parlay those. I think they lose all three of those games. That would it if you parlayed all of that. That would be a hell of a payout. Yeah. As Unfortunately, a, we can't bet on that favorite. stuff in Oklahoma. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, because they're a favorite in all those games. They're they're. I uh, picking Texas to beat Baylor right now may be worse than picking Texas to beat Oklahoma right now. I, I think Baylor's going to be good. I think <laughs> Chapin's going to be good. I know that defensive line is going to be. They got all those guys back. Yep. It, they're so. going to be they're going to be a really tough football team this year. Really tough. Yeah. Look, good luck moving Ika and player off the line of scrimmage. Good luck, guys. Jeez. Figure something else out. <laughs> yeah. This this other one comes from Brian Monson, who says Oklahoma State. All of the grown ass men on that defense from last year are gone a lot of youth unproven guys and a d coordinator running the previous guy's scheme now that's i i can't imagine that they just handed Derek mason the playbook from last year and goes hey this is what you're running i assume he gets some control uh with what's going on on the defensive side of things with oklahoma state but yeah they're they're gonna have a lot of new faces and that's that's the theme in the big 12 that's the theme going into the 2022 season. There are a lot of new faces on all of the teams that finished at the top of the conference last year. And that's why I, I know it's only May 23rd. I'm starting to get real, real excited about Big 12 football. Yeah. Not, not, I, it, it's starting to build for me. Yeah, I, I like Derek Mason. I think he's good. I think, I think they've got some good leftover players, but he is not cold trickle, okay? He's not going to jump into Rowdy's car and beat his lap time, right, just right out of the gate. It, I, I'm sorry, not going to happen. They're going to come back to the pack a little bit. I am curious, though, to see next year who is going to have the number one defense in the Big 12. I'm hoping Oklahoma is is in the fight. I think they. I think they could be a – it's crazy to say like they could be a top three defense in the big 12 because very long ago that was like, what, how could you not be a top three defense in the big 12? But it's a defensive conference now, man, it's totally changed. And really it happened so quickly that we didn't really even know what hit us, but Baylor, Iowa state, Oklahoma state last year. I mean, there's going to be some good defenses again this year. 
I, if, if, if OU plays, if they make it in the top three or even top two defenses in the Big 12, we're going to have a really good football team on our hands. Yeah, no doubt. All right. Birthday shout outs time. Happy 15th birthday to Case Garrett. Happy 21st birthday to Ross Corlett. Happy Corlett or Corlett? Or Corlay. Um, Ooh, Corlay would be awesome. C O R L E T T. Corlay. (laughs) Ross Corlay. Happy birthday. However, it's that, whatever it is, Ross, we nailed it. Happy 24th birthday to Dexter Nichols. Happy 26th birthday to Jonathan Rogers. Happy 28th birthday to Dylan Wiedemann. Happy 28th birthday to Wiedemann. We demand. We demand. I, I'm correcting. We demand. Dylan, we demand. Happy There's two twi- ends on the end. We demand. Happy 28th birthday to Kat Kirkley. Happy 29th birthday to Kristen Robinson. Happy 30th birthday to Max Meyer. Happy 49th birthday to Matt Sheever. Yeah. Yes. That's what I would have gone with. Because Shiver would just be S H I V E R. This is Shiver S H I E V E R. That's what I'm going with. Perfect. Nailed happy it. Happy 51st birthday to Mark Lewis. And happy 10th anniversary to Shay and Chrissy Kavner. And happy upcoming wedding day to Summer and Nate Fisher. Now, we got that a few days ago, so maybe they got married. So if you guys got married, Summer and Nate, yeah. congrats. Congrats. Awesome. Let's talk Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban <laughs> going at it. But first, the only place to stop when you're road tripping is Love's Travel Stops. Love's has over 600 locations in 41 states offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Love's has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite, Java Amore. That coffee is fantastic. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile to go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Loves Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Loves Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Love's Travel Stops. For a full list of what Love's has to offer, visit loves.com. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use our promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. You still get a discount on all of the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com and use our promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Remember, financial aid is available. Nick Saban versus Jimbo Fisher. This is awesome. I love it. And I'm not entirely sure why it's happening. But just just in case you live under a rock and you haven't seen this, Nick Saban at basically a booster event, kind of a caravan type situation there for some Bama boosters, said, quote, A&M bought every player on their team, made a deal for name, image, and likeness. We didn't buy one player, but I don't know if we are going to be able to sustain that in the future because more and more people are doing it, which – Really pissed Jimbo Fisher off. He called a press conference, slept on it, called a press conference for the next morning, had time to gather his thoughts where he called Nick Saban despicable, 
Uh, he did mention no rules were broken. Nothing was done wrong. He basically called Nick Saban a whiner, uh, a narcissist, uh, referred to him as God. Said someone should slap him upside his head. <laughs> said someone should slap him upside his head. Also said that if you ask anyone this worked for him, they know how he operates and people should look into how he operates and said he wasn't answering Nick Saban's calls said he was red button in his ass, Ted. We're done. D U N done. Done. Wow. How uh, fun was this man? I mean, I was eating every single thing. And then Nick Saban went on Sirius XM to say, oh, I shouldn't have singled him out. He didn't really apologize. I mean, he did but, it. And then he went on, the PGA kind of the alternate broadcast, right. With Joe Buck and still really didn't apologize. He, he's mad at the situation. He's mad at the system, Ted. Okay. No, this was personal. He went after Jimbo and him and Jimbo know each other really, really well. Yeah. Uh, it was wild. Um, I understand where Nick Saban is coming from. Because I have the same feeling. Like, I have no problem with NIL, but this isn't NIL. It's it's inducement to come play. Um, now, if Jimbo wants to use semantics to find his way out of the conversation, then he could do that. The thing I thought was really weird is... I felt like he was using his recruits as like human shields because he kept that, saying that was the best part. Yeah. How dare he come after these kids and their families? Yeah. It's like, wait, <laughs> hang on a second, Jimbo. He's coming after you. He's not coming after the kids at all. That's not what he's doing, but he kept They're saying 17 year olds. Yeah. 17. What's kept wrong with throwing that out there? I was like, give me a break, dude. It's amazing. It was, it was wild. It was wild. And he's convinced that they broke no rules. He is the only person that's convinced that they broke no rules, right? He was, he was very careful with what he said, right? Like Texas state law. We didn't break yeah. any Texas state yeah. law. He, he at no point said, oh, yeah, when you compare, compare what we did to – the NCA guidelines that just got put out. Yeah, no, no, no. We're in complete compliance with that. He never said that. He said, yeah, we, we didn't violate any Texas state law. Like we, we followed it to a T and we're really good at following it to a T and he's right. The, yeah. He's right. The NCA is not going to do anything to Texas a and I mean, they're not. So he's, I, I thought what Jimbo Fisher did was brilliant because the NCA, I am still in the camp, even though they put out those guidelines, you know, kind of a scare tactic. I am still convinced they aren't going to be able to do anything. They're not going to be able to do anything. They're not going to be able to enforce any of it. I, I just, I don't think anyone's scared of the NCA. So what did Jimbo Fisher think? Like, Hey, if I'm not scared of the NCA, I'm going to back my players, my recruits, and I'm going to give this fan base what they want to hear. I'm going to tell Saban to go to hell. He hadn't won more than what? Eight games there. Uh, nine, nine. They, nine. they had the one. Was that the COVID year when they had uh, the, I think so. Yeah. yeah. But he hadn't accomplished anything, right? No, he hasn't won the sec. He hadn't even come close to winning the sec. Right. I, but the fans love him right now. I mean, right. adore him right now because he just out beating Bama last year certainly helps a lot. And I think Saban's still really pissed that he lost that game last year. But he looked, I think Jimbo Fisher looked at it, looked at this and went, NCA can't do anything. I'm going to get my fan base going. And I'm going to use, like, I'm going to use the recruits and the kids, like, as my main point. Like, how dare he come after my players? So now I'm defending my players. I'm all of a sudden the players coach. And my fan base is riled up, right? And they're already riled up. Number one recruiting class in the country. Number one recruiting class ever, right? 
and, and now they're looking at this like, yeah, Jimbo standing up to Saban. Saban's scared of Jimbo now. He's trying to, he's trying to get us in trouble. That's exactly what A&M fans are thinking right now. It's hilarious. I love it. It is. Now, here's why I think what Nick Saban did is brilliant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, obviously, what – he does not want this model. He does not want the model, right? And he is, he's trying to get public support for kind of us against them. And he's able to put a, a face on what we don't want. It's Texas A&M, and it's Texas, right? That's what we don't want. We don't want these big collectives. We, th they're buying recruits. This is not the intention of the NIL. But guess what? He plays both of those teams this coming season. And if you can make them be the representation of what everyone hates right now about NIL, and you can go out and pound them, you can say, see that? It don't work. That crap does not work. Yeah, you want to go sign with these guys and maybe make some money, that's fine. It don't work. If you want to win, you better go somewhere that does it right. I think that's what Nick Saban's doing because he doesn't do this stuff just like – he wouldn't say this just on a whim. You know, I think it's I think it's thought out and I think he's trying to make those schools the poster boy for the NIL that's gotten out of hand and then go in there and beat the hell out of them. Yeah, it, and it helps when you've had the best players come into your school for a long time. Yeah, but there's also I and I agree, like I think he. I think Nick Saban, like in its simplest form, he doesn't love how the sport's operating right now. Now, some people viewed that as him, because remember, he said all this stuff in a room full of Bama boosters, right? Mm -hmm. And it was almost like, hey, we didn't buy one player. Why, why not, guys? <laughs> what are we doing here? Are we, are we going to get this rolling or are we going to let – because we remember, he's like, we had the second recruiting class. A&M was first. I think some people in the crowd heard that and they went, yeah, we didn't buy a player. Why didn't we buy any players? <laughs> we should have bought more players. We would have been number one. That, so there's part of me that thinks, and that's like the, the Jedi mind trick of saving, right? I, and I think a lot of people saw that. But I, I think he really just doesn't like how the system's operating. I, I wonder – if part of, if this is part of it, he is built. And first of all, no one believes that they didn't buy one player. I mean, what are we even like, come on guys. What are we, what are we even doing? Nick? Right. Uh, I mean, come on. Everyone knows how Bama has been operating for years and years. It's, it's just that way in the sec. They don't tell on each other. It's fine. It's just how life works in that conference. But let's, let's not just say ridiculous things. I know you're the best ever coach but come on now let's let's be real but I, I wonder if part of him is pissed like he is built he's built such a juggernaut there in Tuscaloosa right and he's done it over years and years and developing guys and now he's got this system where it's like you go there to go be a first round pick right and guys will they will they will suffer through that system because of the reward on the other side. And, and now that system he's built and like that built in advantage that they have now, because they've just been turning out so many NFL guys that that feels like it's being threatened by the way that the new system operates, right? Where, you know, they were getting this, all of these players, they weren't getting all the best players, but they were getting a whole lot of them. And now some of them can be influenced to go to A&M. Some can be influenced to go to Georgia. Yeah, I mean, the NIL money, like the built-in advantage of him just saying, hey, do you want to play in the NFL? Come to Bama. Right? Come be, right. look, hey, 
All of these guys well, have done it. Now that I, I feel like that advantage with NIL money has has been I, I maybe I'm I'm being a little no, too dramatic, but I feel no, like I it's, think you're right. It's dwindling it's, a little bit. Well, it's a threat to it. Right. That's that's why I'm saying that he has pointed to to A and M and said, "Look, everybody, that's the bad way," and he's going to try and score 100 points on them this year. And then everyone that all those those guys in that recruiting class that went to A and M instead of Bama or wherever else they may have gone are going to look at each other walking in to the locker room after the game and say. Did we make the right choice? Did we come to the right school? Is this is this really what what we we signed up for? Is this how it's going to be? I, that's what I think he's doing. Uh, on top of all the other things too, you know. Remember, whenever everyone started playing offense the way that they are now in college football, he said specifically, "Are we sure this is what we want?" Are you sure this is the route that we want to take the game? If it is, okay, fine. And that's whenever they've changed the way that they recruit. And that's why their offense has been as good as it has been in recent years is because he said, okay, fine. If that's what's going to happen, we're going to do it too. And they've been damn near unstoppable. He, he also casually mentioned that players from their team made $3 million in NIL last year. <laughs> right. Just he just worked that in there. Yeah, everyone's hearing these guys go back and forth, right? Jimbo Fisher and Dick Saban, they both make just a just un unbelievable amount of money. And I'm over here like, wait, did he say three million for those players? What? But yeah, it is it was incredibly entertaining. I the the content gods, the, the they continue to smile upon us. Well, I was I was hoping they were really going to smile on us. I uh, when Jimbo started ta- saying, "You go look into it. Look into how he operates." I was like, "Please, Jimbo, please confirm that you guys spied on Oklahoma at the 2003 Sugar Bowl. Please confirm it. That's what we want to know. Everyone wants to know. Give us the content. It'd be great. If 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 he would have come out and said that, would you have been okay? Oh, would it make you feel better? No. Okay. I don't give a shit if they stood on the sideline and watched our practices. There's no way they still shouldn't have beat us. I love that about you. Never I change, just, man. I just want the content. I just, yeah, we just, I <laughs> just let Ted get riled up a little bit and be like, oh yeah, but you know, we still should have beat him. <laughs> oh, by the way, this is not over. I know everyone's talking about October 8th and by the way, that is going to be an incredible day of college football. It is. OU Texas and Bama a and Oh, my God. I guess it was on the same day last year, too, wasn't it? That's the yeah. day they beat them. Yeah. So, I uh, I think a lot of college football fans are circling that day. Oh, but this isn't over. These guys have to be in the same room a couple different times uh, coming up here over the next few weeks. So, that should be very entertaining. Sign me up for it. Oh, yeah. Okay. That dominated all the headlines, right? Jimbo and Saban going back and forth, but there, there were a few really significant things that the NCAA D one council did. And, and the first one was they announced that they are waiving the initial counter scholarship limits for the next two years. So as a lot of, you know, teams were limited to 25 initial counters, per year. So that includes high school recruits, transfer portal guys, JUCO guys. That's, that's how that worked. So for the next two years, teams will be able to bring in as many initial counters as they need to bring in to get to the 85 scholarship limit. That's in D one college football. So this is a, this is a result of kids having an extra year from the COVID season, it's a result of what's going on with the transfer portal and all the movement. But I also think it is a result of common sense because I, I never understood. And I know some people said, Oh, we want to protect kids from getting processed. We want to protect 
you want to protect people from, you know, Bama or Ohio state, just loading up with all the best players and recruiting classes. Like I, I, I get that, but it, it never, it never made sense to me that Kansas couldn't get back to 85 scholarships, right? That right. It, it always made me upset, right? That they were playing with like what 40 something scholarship guys at one point, because they have had, they had had failed coach after failed coach after failed coach. So I am, I'm thrilled. I, I never understood why this rule existed in the first place. I understood some of what people said about it, but I always looked at it and went, aren't we just, aren't we just withholding scholarships, college football scholarships from high school kids and from Juco kids. Isn't that what we're doing? And yeah. That's not what we're doing anymore, Ted. So I think this should be celebrated. No, I think it's good. Um, yeah, you've been, you've been punished for guys transferring away. That, that shouldn't be a punishment if guys are going to transfer and leave and go somewhere else. So I like it. Um, is there going to be some perhaps unintended consequences from it? Yeah, maybe, but it's hard to see right now anything major as a negative coming out of this. I think, I think hopefully it ends up being a, a good positive. And, and like you said, some schools have, have been down for quite some time. Hopefully everyone can get back up and have closer to a, you know, a, a level playing field. Yeah. There was, there was no limit on how many guys could jump into, into the portal from your team. Right. So it, like if you have a coaching change, you have this mass exodus of players and they could after the recruiting season is basically done. Right. Right. Because so you it, have that early signing period. And what new coach wants to take that job and not be able to replenish the roster. Like that's this makes all the sense in the world. And we've heard a lot recently about how the portal is affecting high school kids. Right. And, and how they're being recruited and, and the number of scholarships that they're being offered. And when that was, that was, that limit was at 25 initial counters, man, if you were a coach, especially if you're a new coach or if you're a coach that is on the hot seat, like who are you going to take a, a kid with college football experience from the transfer portal or an 18 year old high school kid? Yeah. Right. I mean, if you're trying to get, get started on a good note as a coach, if you're trying to save your job, hell if, you want to win if you're a coach. So you're always, not always, but a lot of the time, you're going to take the kid you've seen play in college games over the kid you haven't seen play. And now you can get to 85 and maybe you could take both. Right. Because yep. you're not worried about that 25 scholarship limit. So I, I think this is, a, this is a big win for high school recruits who have had a pretty rough go of it since all those guys got that extra year of eligibility in the COVID season. Yep. No, I agree. I think it's good. I think, um, I think it's going to help some teams that have been struggling with coach turnover. And I, I think it's going to help some teams that have had some trouble with um, transfer turnover. I think it's good. I don't see a negative from it other than, you know, which I don't even know that it's a negative. If if you're taking a big number of scholarship guys and maybe you do have to process some guys, you know who's getting processed? It's not it's not the guys that are doing everything right. It's not the guys that are making grades and working hard and showing up to practice and doing what they're supposed to every day, hitting the weight room hard, trying to progress. Those aren't the guys that get processed. The guys that get processed are the guys that you constantly have to fight to keep their grades up, to get to meetings, to do the things that they're supposed to do. So my opinion, that's, that's kind of what you get. If, if you don't want to get processed, do the right things. Do the Coaches, right things. Even if you don't make a ton of plays, there, is still, there are still such things as locker room guys and culture guys. You're a guy that does everything the right way. Coach isn't want to get rid of you. He isn't going to want to get rid of you, even if you're not making a ton of plays for him on the field. Right? Most of the guys on the team aren't making plays. There's a hundred guys in there. Some teams have more than that. And 
you know, you've only got 11 starters, offensive defense, some guys rotate in. There's not a whole bunch of guys out there that are, you know, you, you don't see 50, 60 guys playing on a Saturday. That's not what happens. Most guys are, they're scout team guys. They're, they're backups. They're, you know, special teams guys. It's, you know, it's, it's a big group and you've got to find your role. A, a message to any college football player that feels like he could be in the danger of being processed. Don't be a huge pain in the ass for the coaching staff and you'll be fine. Yeah. Be somebody that they're happy to see every day because your grades are taken care of because the strength staff has said that you're showing up and working your tail off in workouts because you're listening in meetings. You're taking care of your film and you know your playbook. And whenever you're standing there and someone goes down and you have to jog out there, you're not lost. You know what to do. You'll never, you'll never get kicked off of a team for that. Free advice. Free advice. There you go. Okay, another big piece of news from the D1 Council this week. They announced they'll relax restrictions on college football conference championship games, allowing conferences to determine the teams that will play in their conference championship games, which is just a long way of saying conferences don't have to have divisions anymore. And conferences can now have their two best teams in the championship game, giving their conference a best that the best chance to make the college football playoff. So should, and this is, this is great. In my mind, I, I am, I'm all for every conference in college football, having the two best teams play for the conference title. I want to see the best teams play, right? I, if you disagree and you say, oh, we may lose a rivalry game for a year. I'm sorry. I want to see the best teams in college football play each other for conference titles. And, and this rule change, it should result in teams not going four years without playing a team in their conference. Right. That's just silly. Shouldn't happen. So this helps you keep the schedule a little fresher. I think it helps you keep the fan base a little more excited about the schedule. The players are going to love this, right? Because they, I mean, it's fun to play new teams. It's fun to switch it up a little bit every year. So I love it, man. I love it. I love it. As long as it's not used as the opposite of what we hope. I hope it's not used by the SEC to avoid the top teams playing each other. And like with the pod system, I hope it's done properly because I, I don't know. I guess as long as we know how they're going to define who the two best teams are, I, I think we'll be okay. But like, for example, my feeling is that the SEC would just say, okay, Alabama and Georgia are two best teams. Well, let's m totally make sure that they never play each other ever uh, during the regular season. So they can always play in the SEC championship game. That's my worry. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think that especially now Greg Sankey did come they, out. The SEC already does it to some degree. Right. He, but he already came out and he said, hey, we're going to take our time on making a decision uh, about how the SEC is going to look when OU and Texas arrive. So, I mean, that those discussions have been happening, right? And, and they're going to land on a system that it's going to make a lot of people ha happy. It's going to make a lot of people upset, right? There's no perfect system. And that's that's the thing to remember. Like, they're just... There isn't one, but I, I don't think the fans are going to stand for that anymore. Right. If there's no divisions, like, and we've talked about this so much with OU, it's like fans want to see good games, man. So yeah. Greg Sankey, I, I don't think he is worried at all about an sec team going to the college football playoff, no matter what format. So might as well play a badass regular season schedule that gets that helps the SEC dominate college football headlines even more. You know what yeah. I mean? I, I think well, that's I gonna be that. I he, hope that's how they do it. He's coming for CFB domination. 
in my mind. I, I think that's what Greg Sankey's goal. I don't think he's scared about the best teams in the SEC playing the playing each other in the regular season at all anymore. I hope so. I hope that's the case. If if so, sign me up. Yeah. You gotta you gotta look and just think that the people are gonna do the right thing. They're gonna do the best thing for the sport. Ted, all these people in college football, they're great at working together. You know that. <laughs> Come on, man. Okay. That's where the that's that's the real problem is that they'll do the right thing. Okay, I'm I'm putting my trust in their hands, Gabe. Yeah. Pac-12 wasted no time announcing. They're scrapping divisions in 2022. So the two highest conference winning percentage teams, they're going to play each other in the Pac-12 championship game. The Mountain West announced they will eliminate divisions starting in 2023. And I thought this gave me a good chuckle, right? In the Mountain West press release, it cited that it will give them the best position to get a team in the college football playoff. I mean, okay, guys. What are really? Okay. But I I like it. And when I saw this, I I thought to myself, what conference, what conference would be dumb enough to keep divisions? And then it dawned on me. That would be the most Big Ten thing ever. <laughs> the Big Ten was like, you guys don't care about tradition and rivalries the way that we do. We're going to keep the, the East and West and let you guys all do the divisionless nonsense because we're smarter than you. That would be a very Big Ten thing to do. Well, the Big 12 may go from not having divisions, adding teams, and then, yeah, let's do divisions now that you don't have to have them. Let's go ahead and do it with the four new teams we're bringing in. <laughs> that would be That would be something. I hope looking at the future of the big 12, I hope, you know, once OU and Texas have moved on, I would like, I would like three, four team pods. That's how I want it done. And then you play the three teams in your pod and then you play six other teams, whether that's three from the other and three from another or however they want to work that out. But it would be, it would be very easy and very clean that way in my mind. And you don't go more than two years in a row without playing a team so well, like you or don't go more than one year in a row without so like you you never go two straight years without playing a team it's the easiest way to do it in my head well i think the same thing about when we go to the sec there should be four four team pods and i think every four years if you do it schedule it right you'll play everyone in the conference and that's how you should do it every every player that's run their through their four years should play everyone and i think after every four years you can redraw the pods if you want to and and change them up and do another cycle that's the best way to do that system and that pretty much guarantees that that will not be what they do yeah we'll see there's we're, we're gonna have a lot of discussions between now and OU getting into the sec about this whole thing no doubt all right let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend but first, it's time to get back out on the golf course, and there's nothing better to drink on the course than the number one seltzer in golf, Clubby Seltzers. Clubby Seltzers in Oklahoma Company that is already winning national awards because their product is delicious. It tastes exactly like a club special, but it's a seltzer. They're not just for the golf course either. They're perfect to drink by the pool, after mowing the lawn, whatever. If you haven't tried Clubby Seltzers yet, go grab some. You won't regret it. Clubby's first variety pack is coming out this month. To find a place near you that has Clubby's, visit clubbyseltzers.com. Quick story. Was that the PGA Championship at Southern Hills? Yeah. Guy walks up, looks left, looks right. You want a Clubby? <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, I do. What do you mean? They weren't selling Clubby's at the PGA Championship, Ted. You got a rogue Clubby? I got multiple <laughs> rogue clubbies and i was very happy about it did you feel like you were doing a drug deal out there i, I took a picture i took a picture it, it's it, i've got the clubby in the hand and uh what was it the seventh seventh green in the background oh i've got i've got photographic evidence that i was breaking rules that's awesome attention Fantastic. business owners you need insurance in your life they're not going to break rules they're going to do it by the book people 
Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from insurance from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? I love it. I, we've got to give these guys the respect they deserve. OU Baseball, they closed out the season winning their last five conference series in a row ultimately um took two or three over texas tech there at at the end Uh, really really good stuff it's the most conference wins oklahoma has had since the 2010 season they're doing really good right now bats are hot pitching is is doing really well they're the number three seed in the big 12 tourney playing west virginia and i Oklahoma's got a they got a chance to to win that tournament right now the way that they're playing they're hot yeah I like it look at you so thought about going with tennis playing in the national championship coming up women's tennis they are playing right now and the singles update this came 32 seconds ago from OU women's tennis I they are they are currently down two to one Uh, to Texas but a lot of tennis to be played so we'll see we'll see if that has been decided by the time we wrap up here but i congratulations or not i don't know i'm nervous for him i really don't want him to lose to texas in the national championship they'll be fine but yeah ou baseball uh deserves the shout out they've been playing really good right now and hey they got a chance to possibly do some damage in the ncaa tourney as well Good stuff. You, Skip Johnson's got them rolling. Yeah. You want to be hot. They will the number three seed, their number three seed in the Big 12 tournament. And they will play West Virginia in the first round of the Big 12 championship on Wednesday. And then so. I think if they win that game, they have the winner of Tech and oh gosh. If they win that game, they have the winner of game four. So that would be t- Kansas State and Texas Tech. Yeah. Yep. And that game will be on ESPNU. So nice. Good. So I expect him to win. I expect him to beat West Virginia. Come on now. I expect him to beat West Virginia. Then I expect expect him to beat Texas Tech in the next game. Everyone knows that we know everything there is to know about OU baseball. So just trust us, people. I know everything that Toby Rowland has said about OU baseball. Okay? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Udiev is your loser of the weekend. Oh, I felt bad, but it turned out uh, to be excellent drama. I had to go with Mito Pereira. Just the old, uh, the slice, the fade into the pond or into the creek on 18. That's the first time since Phil Mickelson did it. Uh, at winged foot that someone has lost a major with a one stroke lead going into the final hole, just brutal to watch, but it gave us a great playoff and Justin Thomas coming back from what seven down after 54 holes and gets the win in a playoff. It, it was, it was excellent drama closing out the end of that. It uh, was a great tournament. It was I feel like everyone that was watching was cheering for Mito to bogey 18 so there'd be a playoff. Right. Yeah. I don't think anyone was cheering for him to double it. Right. Yeah. And when he hit that tee shot, if you go back and look at that swing, oh, and it's like that ball 
It was like a magnetic force taking it to that creek. It was, oh, it was brutal, but I was hoping it felt like the guy, he deserved to be part of the playoff. And yeah. that was, it felt I, like it right up until he hit that tee shot. Anyways, I, I felt bad, you know, because I was talking with a friend today and, um, we were like, I don't know anything about the guy leading. And I said, the only thing I know about him is he's probably going to shoot 77 today. And he almost, hit, he almost hit that number. Just a young, only his second major to find yourself in that position, uh, just to wake up Sunday morning as, uh, the leader of a major and then be on a, on 18, one shot up. And just everything in your your soul saying, just don't hit it in the water. Just don't hit it in the water. Just don't hit it in the water. It's just it's a mental, it's just mental warfare. Got to be tough. So there's obviously the golf side of it, right? Uh, I mean, we all, even if you were you were cheering for him to kind of melt down on 18. I think anyone that was cheering for that when he doubled, everyone was like, oh man, like it it just felt. It was a hard watch, man. But there is the financial side to professional golf. Mito would have won two point seven million if he would have part eighteen. Instead, he doubled it, tied with Cam Young, and got eight hundred seventy thousand dollars, meaning he lost one point eight three million dollars on the eighteenth hole. That is an expensive tee shot. It's Very expensive. Wow. JT was awesome in the playoff, though. Oh, God. He oh, was my great. gosh. He it's was like he's dead. been there before or something. Sal yeah, Torres, man, how many times is he going to get second? I know. He's good. Good young golfer. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And, hey, standing O for Southern Hills course was awesome. It was beautiful. It was a hell of a challenge. We saw all four seasons in four days somehow. It was, I thought it was, I thought it was great. Really, really well done. The only thing I didn't like is that they kept playing that damn living on Tulsa time song. Like that's all we listened to in Oklahoma. <laughs> that's it. That's all we got. <laughs> no, I, I went, went Saturday and Sunday, Saturday. That, that weather was miserable, man. It was, it was cold and like, like spit and mist. It was awful. But it was so bad. Tiger Woods was like, I am out of here, guys. See ya. <laughs> see ya. I'm good. Thanks. Fire up the jet, boys. I did get to see Tiger Woods play golf in person awesome. for the first time. It's awesome. And watching a crowd follow him is something, man. Oh. Is it just like a glob of people making their way around. It's the incredible. Course? I mean, it's incredible. But yeah, it was we we had this set up on the seventh fairway, so you could see you could see shots into seven and then eight tee box was right behind it. So I could go, I could watch the shot in from seven, kind of walk down with it, watch him putt, then go watch them all tee off on eight, which on Sunday, Ted par three, eighth hole playing a casual 253 yards into the wind. <laughs> I was like, I was like, dude, I'm hitting driver and I'm probably not getting there. Oh my god. Well, that's dude, I saw Zalatoris on the 625 yard par 5 go driver 3 iron in. He hit like a 270 or 280 yard par uh 3 iron. On on Sunday, Rory Rory had it rolling early, right? It looked like he may go real low, but he Putts on seven. I'm like, oh, got to go. And by the way, Rory's got a big crowd that follows him too. I mean, a lot. And he has one of the most recognizable walks on planet Earth. It's like you're, that's Rory. Yeah. <laughs> and that's funny. He he is looking. He, he steps into the eighth tee. It's playing over 250. He's looking and he's like looking up at the trees. And he just pulls an iron out of the bag and just wait. I was just like, oh my god! Watching that dude hit a golf ball is fun, man. It's crazy. Yeah, and he's a little dude, but he rips. It. What's he like? Five ten? Yeah, he's not very tall, but I will say, he works out. Jack, yeah, he's, he's 
Got he, he's one of the, he's like the guy I'm like, yeah, that dude lifts. Nice, Rory. But I will say Southern Hills, I never been on the golf course. My number one takeaway, I want no part of that golf course. <laughs> I mean, yeah. absolutely I no part to of play it. it until I saw it on TV. And then it's like, yeah, you guys can have it's that like one. the walk up to the gift shop. Like the, the, it's not a shop like Birch indoor facility is basically, it was like a college indoor facility of all the PGA Southern Hills Birch. Like you go up like 18 and I, it, it was not, I was like, <laughs> God dang, man, <laughs> that place was a madhouse, by the way. But yeah, it was really well done. That was the first major tournament I had ever been. It was it was so easy getting in and out like security, everything. It was, it was great. Awesome. And I did have Good. an open bar, so that never hurts. That's great. Good stuff, man. It was awesome. They pulled off a, a great event. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. Congratulations. Nine one eight. You guys, uh, you done good. That was, that was fantastic. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. But first, First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs. Checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more, they do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. If you are a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you're doing. Head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. You got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was just voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate, and you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcony's Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcony's Pot Still Bourbon. It's big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year-round. Remember, in 2012, Balcony's Single Malt won the best-in-glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen, and became the first American distillery to win the competition. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcones products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but yes, the owners, they are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit BalconesDistilling.com. All right, for my winner of the weekend, I, I just, I got to be honest, thought about going with USC. Because in a shocking development, Jordan Addison has committed to be a USC Trojan. And listen, I I know there are a lot of people out there still upset with maybe how this whole thing went down, you know, possible tampering, all that. But at the end of the day, we really don't know what all happened, what order it happened in, who contacted who. But USC just added arguably the best wide receiver in the country to their team. And that's a big deal for Lincoln Riley. Despite how we may feel about him, that's that is a very good addition for that football team. It is, it is, and I saw that. Was it? Was it Stuart Mandel that had USC number four in his top twenty-five? And by the oh. way, he also I think he had him number four. He definitely had Oklahoma outside of the top twenty-five in his preseason top twenty-five, but. Yeah, it's a, it's good for USC. Offensively, they're stacking it up, man. They've got a lot of really good talent there at skill positions, uh, light at the offensive line, and light on defense. But I think they'll be improved over last year for sure. How much improved? They definitely will not be the number four team in the country. They, I'll say it right now, they're going to win more games than a lot of OU fans want them to win. I'm starting to get they that. They got feeling. a really easy schedule. Got an easy schedule. The Pac 12 in itself, not exactly a, a grind, but you just got to, they, they, got, they got some really, really talented guys on offense. They just do. So, yeah. They're, we don't have to love it. Yeah. Don't have to cheer for them or anything like that, but they're going to they're gonna score some points, man. They've got an easy schedule. 
um, until they play Notre Dame and Utah. Utah is going to absolutely destroy USC next year. You've said it multiple times. I, I agree. All right, but my winner of the weekend, Oklahoma softball, went three and zero in the Norman Regional, including Sunday. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, hey, Texas A and M, they were they were feeling pretty good about that three to two game that happened on Saturday. Saw saw some A and M fans, you know, excited about the rematch on Sunday. And then the old Sooners put a nine piece on them in the top of the first end up winning 20 to nothing over Texas A&M on Sunday. That is, if you're keeping score at home, that is the largest win in NCAA softball tournament history. And it was the 37th run rule for Patty Gasso's squad this season. And it was over after one inning that it was that watching that the top of the first inning. And it was weird because, Oh, you was playing in Norman, but they are technically the away team. So they're batting first. And I'm guessing Texas A&M wish they would have gotten to bat first, at least <laughs> because coming out of the bottom or coming out of the top of the first, they had to be like, well, this is over. Yeah. And it was everyone. I mean, it was everyone doing damage to them. And Alo, she sent that one to the moon. <laughs> that was her second at bat of the inning. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If there is a softball equivalent of a 77 to zero score, like the football team gave uh, A&M back in the day, I think 20 to zero in a uh, NCAA softball tournament regional is the equivalent, right? Isn't that it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I kind of felt bad. Worse. I. Once again, I felt I felt this feeling a couple of times with this team this year where I'm just like, God, oh, come that's on, just have some compassion. <laughs> you guys are mean. You're bullies. No, it was it was awesome to watch. I'm just kidding. I didn't feel bad for AM. They wanted the yeah. rematch. They got it, baby. And that's a good this team, is, though. AM is a is a is a pretty salty team, so that's an impressive win. Yeah. I mean, that that game on Saturday was close. That was a really good game. And to put a 20 piece on them. And Nicole May completely shut him down. She was great. I that was impressive. And OU headed to the Super Regionals for the twelfth straight year. Ooh. Clearly, they will host the Super Regional against UCF. Uh, as we're recording this, those those dates and times have not been released yet. But feel pretty confident. Sooners and Norman seeing uh, they've won forty four straight home games. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any doubt. One fun tidbit, 10 bit, tidbit. Did I say 10 bit? <laughs> I'm losing no it. It's been, a, it's been a long weekend, man. <laughs> but Jocelyn Allo, uh, now hitting over 500 on the season. <laughs> Just casual, man. That's crazy. She's and, amazing. And if you're paying attention out there to softball, you know, Alabama has been, been a big deal. Patty Gasso talked about their favorable draw in the regional. Uh, not so much. They got eliminated by Stanford in that Tuscaloosa regional. They're out. How about that? Pretty wild. Yeah, I saw them. They pulled uh, Montana Fouts out of the game, let her get the ovation, and that was it. And that was it. That was weird. Not yep. used to seeing, I clearly used to seeing them at the Women's College World Series. Be a shame not to see all the Bama fans there. I didn't what see the end of the the what Florida State and was it Mississippi State were in a pretty close game. I didn't see the end of it though. Yeah, but I really only care about OU. Just just right. let me know who's in the World Series. That's that's really all I'm worried about. All right, for my loser of the weekend, thought about going with Charles Leclerc. Man, uh, a lot going on in the sports world, but still got my F1 fix in. Ted, this guy fastest. In all three practice sessions in Spain, one qualifying, so he started on the pole, was leading the Spanish Grand Prix until the sport's weird, man. Car just it just stops working. Power goes out. And he's just screaming in the radio, no, no. <laughs> and it's kind of brutal for him. 
because it, it and who knows if he would have been able to hold off for Stappen. But well, history would say no, he would not be able to hold off for Stappen. Well, I I don't know, man. Leclerc he, he was leading in the driver standings until this race because hey, guess who ended up winning? Uh, Lewis Hamilton. No, although Lewis Hamilton he got hey he got in a little fender bender on on the first lap of the race and it worked. fixed the porpoising. They they have it's certainly it's certainly better. George Russell, his teammate, finished third, but Lewis Hamilton got damage to the car on lap one. Said had to come all the way back from P nineteen. I think he finished fifth because signs got by him with only a lap or two to go. But it was I think he was driver of the day. He had quite the comeback. Had to work through a lot of traffic nice. to get that top five finish. Well, impressive stuff. And I did see something that. Formula One is like one of the like the fastest growing sports or whatever you call it out there right now as far as uh, getting attention. And I get, I'm guessing it had to come from the the Netflix deal, right? They do. The show's great. You got to watch yeah. it, man. And because the races really are like if you're just sitting there watching it on TV, it's not like the most exciting thing in the world. But like you, you get attached to the characters. You sure. know, that's, sure. that's where, that's where the, I, I think the sport is growing because of that aspect of things, but you didn't guess for stepping one, man. Come on. Um, are you shocked? You seem shocked. Well, okay. I guess I should have guessed that because whenever you said, who knows if you would have been able to hold off versus stop and, uh, yeah, I should have known that that's who won. So, but he hey, had some DRS issues, worked through him, Ted. Huh. One, two finish Good. for Red Bull with Perez finished in second. Well, that's what happens whenever your crew guy can actually, actually keep your car running. Unlike, uh, Leclerc. Yeah. Yes. You got to go the, with, with the powers going out and they, cause they do the radio. Like they let you listen into the radio communication, which is really cool. And he was just so sad. He's like, no, no, no. God, no. <laughs> it's basically <laughs> what it was. It was pretty funny. Oh. Brutal sport, brutal sport. All right, but my loser of the weekend, man, Boston Celtics. And this series is, I mean, it's confusing. So Boston went to Miami, right, game two, and whooped up on the Heat, right? They had Marcus Smart back. They had Al Horford back. They got after the Heat in game two. But then dropped game three in Boston to the Heat. With Butler out, right? Jimmy Butler didn't even play in the second half, and I am fully convinced he could have played in the second half. They were up by so much. I think Eric Spolstra and the trainers, because it was knee inflammation. I think Jimmy Butler was hurting, and they're like, guys, you got to be able to hang on to a 20-plus point lead without him. Go get it done. And to their credit, man, they did, and the Heat got blasted in game two. And they came out and set the tone early in game three. They were up as many as 26 in the first half of that game. And bam, out of bio was that Duke. Super aggressive, just dominant throughout the game. Uh, 31 and 10 in game three for bam after having really disappointing performances in game one and two of this series. I thought PJ Tucker was also huge for Miami. I mean, hit some really timely shots. And the Celtics were just careless with the basketball, man. 24 turnovers in the game. That being said, Jalen Brown buries a three with like two minutes and 40 seconds to go in the game to cut it to one. And all the momentum was on Boston's side. But for the Heat to be able to hold on and win, it was, I mean, super impressive. Max Strews continues to hit big shots. Bam played the best he's played in a while. It was it was really impressive watching them hold on to that win. Yeah, I it's been it's been crazy with the guys that have been out and like just kind of what's happened health wise so far in the series, and the fact that it, it's looked like so one sided at times, but. I still think it's a great – it's going to be a great finish. Like, as things tighten up and, you know, the backs get closer to the wall and, you know, being eliminated is is going to be close. Like, 
whichever team ends up in that position, it, it's going to be it's going to be a fight to the death. I I like these two two teams in the style they play. Physical, tough. It's cool. Good to watch. I have been I have been very complimentary of Jason Tatum. Right? And you know, talking about the possibility of him being a top 5 guy in the league, right? He was bad in this game. 3 of 14, 10 points, 6 turnovers. Uh, now, Jalen Brown turned it over a lot, but at least he was affecting the game. It was just a it was a weird performance from Tatum. And the more that I thought about it, it's like top five guys, they don't have games like this. And it made me think of Giannis, right, in that game seven. Yeah. Where we were saying, man, he didn't, for Giannis, he didn't play great. Man, he didn't shoot it particularly well. He looked a little tired. Remember the Bucks got blown out by the Celtics in game seven? Yeah. Giannis had 25, 20, and nine in that game. I'm trying, didn't Tatum have a bad game? Was it in the previous series? Yeah, he's had a couple of these, and that's where, like, you can't have – if you're Jason Tatum, and, and and he has taken some games over in these playoffs, and it's been incredibly fun to watch. But if if you want to be put on that level, right, with, with Giannis and, and Jokic and LeBron and Luka and these guys, you can't have 10 and 6 in a conference finals game at home. You just can't. You can't do it. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It was weird. It was weird to watch, but <laughs> I will give the Boston Celtics trainers some credit. Apparently those people are miracle workers because I thought Marcus Smart's leg was going to fall off and Jason Taylor, he made it, he made it look like his shoulder was just, he was, they're going to have to amputate dead. That right, that right arm was going to have to come off the body, but it is, um, some quick recoveries for Marcus Smart. Oh, the best part. It's like they're showing him running out of the tunnel, and he's jogging pretty good. And then once he clears the tunnel and the fans can see him, real significant limp all of a sudden start developing. It was it's amazing. Oh, miracle workers, those Celtics traders. The it's best amazing. in the business, apparently. And I know these guys are tough. I know they're they're physically tough. Marcus Smart is a big ass dude. He's strong. He's tough. It's just it's strange. Never figured it out. I mean, I'm, it, I'm convinced he's got a little WWE in him. Like he's just an entertainer, man. Like he just he gives the people what they want. And it is the Celtics. I mean, at least they didn't carry him out in a wheelchair, right? Like yeah, they did. Uh, um, there was people were trying to con- trying to compare it to Paul Pierce, but it, it was, there was no wheelchair involved, but it was, yeah, a couple of miraculous recovery moments there for, for Marcus Smart and Jason Tate. But I will say this, and, and I've heard other people talk about it. I'm not quite sure why the NBA is making these guys play every other day. They, even, even when they travel, they're playing every other day and no rest days. Uh, in, in between, not an extra rest day for the travel stuff. It's it's a lot of a lot of dudes are beat up in these series, right? It's the same way in the Western Conference Finals. So I don't I don't know whose decision that was, but that I I think it's if they got because, a little more rest, because remember going back to the bubble, remember how competitive and like that the the level of play was was so high because and guys talked about it a ton. They didn't have to travel. They didn't have to deal with that. Like it was so much easier on their bodies. And I don't know. I don't know why the NBA, it it feels like they're rushing the conference finals for whatever reason. Yeah. I don't, I think it's they're They're in a tough spot because I know there's, there's always been complaints that the playoffs take too long and they drag on forever, but you know, and then you've got, you got to think about the players and I mean, ultimately what you want to see is the best players healthy, fresh and have it be decided on the court, not decided by who's the least banged up, you know? So yeah. I don't know. It's tough, tough yeah. balance. Yeah. It's just, I was watching that heat Boston games. I was like, who's left. Man, <laughs> It was, it was, it was brutal. All right. Episode two sixteen in the books. We'll have a new podcast. That'll drop Thursday morning. 
Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me from 3 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. I just realized we haven't talked about when we're going to record on Wednesday, so we'll let it, – it'll be a surprise when the next episode <laughs> comes out. You guys, you guys will love it. I'm sure it'll be great. Hope you all have a great week. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening and do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.